Thank you for tuning in tonight. This is unusual for us to have a Friday night service, but uh, as, as your pastor, I'm doing my best to, to stay connected. And this is a special week for all of us that claim the name of Christ. If you're a Christian, you know what week this is. And, and we have emphasized each of the steps uh, with our services. If you recall, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday night, we talked about his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. And when they laid the, laid the palm branches in front of him while he was riding the back of a donkey. And I taught you what that meant. Last Sunday, uh, we talked about the fact that, that he was rejected, that, that, um, uh, that the priest and the scribes and, and the elders, they, and even Pilate himself, even though he tried to wash his hands to, to say he wasn't guilty of rejecting Christ, he himself rejected Christ. And I explained why that was the case. Well, today is Friday. And um, today is a, is a sad and yet at the same time a triumphant day for Christians. And I'll explain why I made that odd statement when I give you the title of this message, because we're going to take the words of Christ as he was on the cross and he made this phrase, it is finished. And so I want you, if you have your Bible, please turn to, to John chapter 19. And, and when you get to chapter 19, I just want you to focus on verse 30. Now we're going to cover and what we're going to say is really going to encompass more than just 30. Uh, verse 30, but I, I really do want you to see this for yourself. These are the words of Christ, and the Bible says in verse 30 of chapter 19 of John, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. Alan Carr in his writings says that our Savior made some truly great statements while he was alive. I want to read just a few of the great statements. I don't know that this is an exhaustive list, but, but certainly great, great statements made by our Lord. In John chapter 8, he said, Before Abraham was, I am. For anyone who wants to, to question the eternal existence of Jesus Christ, just look at what he said in John chapter 8, Before Abraham was, I am. Then in John chapter 10, he says, I and my Father are one. What an interesting If you don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, you would think that was an audacious statement, but... It was a true statement. He and the Father are one, Jesus, co-equal, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then John chapter 14 and verse 9, he that has seen me hath seen the Father. I think it's interesting. The disciples are sitting around and they're asking what God is like, and, and the Lord is, is perplexed by their question. He said, how long have you been with me? And you asked a question like that. One of my personal favorites is, is in Revelations chapter 22 and verse 20. Revelation 22, verse 20, the Bible says, surely I come quickly. I don't know uh, about you and what your, where your mind has been with this pandemic. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those that gets up early in the morning and begin to ponder things. And I, I'm wondering in my own mind, is the stage being set for the end of all things? I'm not up here being a preacher of, of doom in that regard, but one day there's gonna be a generation that, that sees his return uh, one day this is all going to be over and we'll all give an account of ourselves to God. I love the fact that he reminds us he's coming. John chapter six is a great statement by Jesus. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I want you to, to hear this next statement. I believe just quoting the words of Christ is like a gold mine of theological truth. But hear me and hear me well, please. There's not a greater truth that could be stated than when Jesus died. And he said, it is finished. I want to talk to you, just really draw three truths from this text. And, and I want you to understand what it means when Jesus died for you. The first thing I want to remind you, it was a painful death. I can't, cannot say that with any more emphasis. I want to emphatically state it was a painful death. His death was torture and pain. I, I, I'm not going to be able in just a short challenge tonight to be able to, to show you everything and all the idiosyncrasies and, and, and intricate details of the death of Christ. I, I couldn't do that. I don't think we'd have the time to do that. I can tell you this, it was painful. I can tell you that the Bible records he was tortured. I can tell you that the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, he was scourged. The word of God says in, in Luke 22 that they beat him. Matter of fact, one of the gospel says beyond recognition. And then he was spat upon in Matthew 27. He was mocked 
in 27 as well. Then ultimately he was nailed to a cross, a cross which actually would be a battle of, of the will of you would push yourself up to get a breath of air. And then you would let yourself hang. And then when they say his hands and his feet, it really, in all probability, was his ankles and his wrists because they'd want to go through the bones. Can you imagine your arms outstretched and nails through your wrist and nails through your ankles? And to be able to breathe, you push up against that cross and you try to take a breath. And then because of the pain, and you know the pain would have to be excruciating as he pushed and as he lifted with his arms, you would let yourself back down and then suffocation would begin. And it would be a battle until he would give his last breath. I would say to you, the death is an absolute torture and pain, but I would say to you, not only was his death a torture and painful, but the word of God tells us his death was shameful. And let me explain what I mean by that. He is dying in the place of a common criminal. As a matter of fact, he is dying in the place of a man who took another man's life, a murderer. That's Barabbas. Uh, the Jewish people would have rather at that time, a week earlier, they're celebrating. We talked about this Wednesday. A week earlier, they're celebrating his entrance into Jerusalem. They're emphasizing his, his power and his miracles. They're probably wanting to see some of that. They're laying palm branches in front of him and they're celebrating his entrance while he rides on a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah chapter nine. But a week later, they're screaming, let the murderer go free and kill Jesus. The Bible says that he dies in the place of a common criminal, how symbolic that is for him dying for our sins, that he was stripped naked before the world. I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but how embarrassing how that would make one feel to, to stand or to, to actually hang on a cross dying completely naked. And the Bible says they, they did things like ripping out his beard and yanking off his robe before they nailed him to the cross. Can you imagine the beatings that, that took place? Dr. Truman Davis has an article that goes in detail about this, but but the, the, the blood on his back, they would put that robe, that, that purple robe, that fake royalty they were mocking him with. And about the time the blood would begin to collaborate on the on on the, the, the fabric of, of the robe and then they would yank it off and reopen those wounds. I can't imagine, I can't even begin to imagine the pain that Jesus Christ faced. They mockingly put a crown of thorns on his brow and pushed it into his skin. They placed a sign above him that said, Hail King of the Jews, all of that mockery. It was a, it was a big joke to the Roman soldiers and to be quite frank with you, I'm pretty sure the chief priest and, and, and those that were around, scribes and elders alike, were celebrating because here comes Jesus changing what, what they had established as their church, and I'm saying that word accurately, and they want him off. They want him destroyed. They want him off of the scene. Can I say to you, it was a painful death. It was a shameful death, but I certainly need to say to you, it was a death that involved quite a bit of agony. And why would I, why would I want to emphasize that to you? Well, I think some of the agony of the cross is simply this. He knows that his heavenly father has turned his back on him. He cries out, why have you forsaken me? And man's sin is on the back of our Lord. And it's so evident that a holy God turns his back on the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ. His son, our today master and savior, at that point, our redeemer. I want to say to you, and I want to emphasize with, with much emphasis, it was a painful death. But then I, I must say this to you. It was an accomplishing death. You say, preacher, what do you mean it was an accomplishing death? Well, I want you to understand what was being done, what was being accomplished at the time. The word finished was spoken by our Lord. And, and I want you to just paint, paint the picture if I can. I, I, in my years of teaching homiletics, I would always tell the young men that they need to do what they can to vividly paint the picture so people can imagine what's going on in their minds. And so I want you to, to imagine for just a moment, our Lord outstretched arms hanging there on the cross and in their minds, this is a bloody period. And what I mean by that is an exclamation mark, a, a, a punctuation mark. This is boom, period. It's over. But it's not going to be over. 
there's an illustration that tells the story that I, I think kind of kind of thinks what might have been in the mind of those that took his life. The, the illustration is about uh, Mount McKinley, and they understand that there was a skeleton that was found at the the, north, the most northern point of that mountain, and the skeleton was there at the root of a tree. And obviously the man that was there, the body they found, had scratched into the tree the end of the road. The tragic story is he had tried to conquer a lofty mountain and he had failed and he had died in the process. And that was supposed to be the end, the period to the end of the sentence of his life. And in their minds, that was Jesus Christ. But when Jesus says it is finished, he was not talking about a punctuation mark at the end of a sentence. He wasn't saying it's all over. It literally means it is accomplished. Now hold on to that thought. I hope, I hope that the chills just went down your, your spine like mine because I think it's awesome to think about. It is accomplished. He's finished his work. He, he has done what, what is required for us to be redeemed. And when I see the phrase, it is accomplished, that is a triumphant statement. That's not a sad statement. Even though he loses his life for us, he dies in our place. My friend, I want you to understand, he died in our place to accomplish what we could never accomplish. He was the perfect sacrifice. He had not sinned, not a bad thought, not a bad word, no bad deed. Nothing that he had done would contradict his father's law. I can't say that. And I know I, have, I pastor some really good people, but none of the people that I pastor can say that because all of us are sinners. Matter of fact, even the good we do are as filthy rags, the word of God says. We, we, we even at our best are terrible, nasty sinners. Jesus Christ, the only one that's ever lived that's perfect, he accomplished something for us. He redeemed us when he said, it is finished. He paid the price that was required. The statement brings us not only to the reality of what he accomplishes, but it brings us also to the reality of his humanity. This is so important. I, I know I, I use this phrase occasionally, but when I learned it and I learned of it whenever I was in my undergrad in systematic theology, but the hypostatic union, the fact that, that Jesus Christ was fully man and fully God, it just it mesmerized me as I actually wrote a paper on it in my college days. Fully man and fully God. It's important that you understand he was both. For you see, he had to be fully man to die for our sins. And, and he had to be fully man to even experience suffering. We sing when he, when he was on the cross, a song about him being on the cross. He could have called 10,000 angels and I believe he could have. But, but John wrote in his gospel and his gospel dates around 100 AD. So, so really uh, 100 years after the death of Christ, when, when Gnosticism was popular in, in, in that day, a, a heresy that was creeping up uh, among the people, and, and they would say that Jesus wasn't a, a physical body but was a spirit. <laughs> That's heresy. He was a physical body that suffered. He understood suffering. They would say a spirit could not suffer, could not feel pain, but he was as we are. He felt pain. He suffered. We even see more of his humanity while he hangs on the cross. He's omniscient. There's nothing he does not know. And yet he says he thirsts. The Bible says that they, they take a hyssop branch. I'm so thankful that John of the four gospels is the one that records it. A hyssop reed, as it were. And they put some sponge and they, they, they mockingly are going to give him water. But it's not water, it's vinegar. Again, another sign of mockery at the cross. But you... And I probably picked up when I used the phrase a hyssop reed. Because if you remember at Passover, <laughs> this is so special and wonderful, but at Passover, when we read about it in the Old Testament, they would take hyssop branches and they would apply it to the top of the door and to the sides, of course, we know was forming a cross. We know the miracle that took place when the death angel uh, came through Egypt and only those that had the blood applied to the door would have the firstborn in their family survive. Can I say to you, it's probably not a coincidence that a hyssop reed is what was used to, to hold up that sponge for our Lord to be, and I hate to use the phrase, it's just what's in Scripture, to be laughed at again. I'd say to you, they probably thought that 
the Jews were crazy putting blood on their door the morning after when, when Egypt awoken. They found out that the firstborn in their family was dead. To every home that the blood was not applied, they saw the seriousness of it. Can I say to you, Jesus Christ dying in our place, what, what a picture, what a blessing. I would say to you that it was a painful death, but I would say secondly, it was accomplishing death. And then I want to say thirdly, it almost seems redundant, but I, I really think you'll understand why I want to use this phrase, it was a successful death. When I make that statement, I put in my notes, this doesn't sound right. I, don't, I hardly ever talk to myself on my notes quite like that, but when you realize what was accomplished, you see it was successful. And here's what I mean. Christ's death was a necessary sacrifice. Your sin has to be paid for, period. God's not sweeping sin under the rug. The picture of this sacrifice is the ultimate sacrifice. And the Jews would have known the sacrificial system. It was all they had known. I mean, from the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve sinned, you know, the animal were killed to give them clothes to wear. We go a little bit further and we see the children of Israel at Passover. I just made reference to it where one animal would actually be sacrificed and the blood would be applied and form, as it were, a cross on, on the door. And it was one sacrifice for one family. You cannot study the Old Testament and not begin to realize even in the new, <laughs> when the high priest would come and, and make sacrifice once a year for a nation. They would enter into the Holy of Holies and the high priest, the only one that could, could enter in, would have the sins rolled back for a year. And everything I just told you was a picture of coming attractions, a preview of coming attractions, I meant to say. Everything I just expressed to you was a picture of things to come. For you see, we went from one animal for one man to one sacrifice for one family, to one sacrifice for a nation, to ultimately the only real sacrifice that mattered, the only sacrifice that literally paid for sin. It didn't roll back sin. It satisfied God's wrath upon sin. That's Jesus Christ. And so it was a necessary sacrifice. Secondly, it was a sacrifice that gave a stilling to God's wrath. I am... Um, I love being able to tell you this, but Christ's death was a propitiation, a propitiation for our sin. Let me read the text that, that helps you understand it. It's Romans chapter three, verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. There really are, are two facets, or if you allow me to say so, it's almost two sides of the same coin. Yes, Jesus Christ died in our place. The substitutionary atonement, he died in our place. Yes, that is part of what took place when he died on Calvary. You cannot sidestep that. Matter of fact, I don't want to sidestep that. I praise his name that he did that for you and for me. But the other side of the same coin is the wrath of God was satisfied. The wrath of God had to be satisfied for man to go free. Jesus Christ satisfied the wrath of God. And so it was a successful death. It was a successful death because it was a necessary sacrifice and only Jesus could do it. It was a successful death because it was a stealing of God's wrath. It was a successful death because it brought for you and me reconciliation. I don't know if you're feeling it right now, and I'm not necessarily always, I'm a Baptist-styled preacher. I'm not basing things on feeling but it's hard to make that statement that it brought reconciliation and not feel something. I am. Um, I think about my Lord sitting on the right hand of the Father today, accomplishing and fulfilling what would take place so that I could have an eternal home. And so you could have an eternal home. Second Corinthians chapter five. I want you to, sometimes you can kick your mind in neutral when a preacher's preaching, but please don't do that. Read with me these verses or at least listen to, to me as I read these verses. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 18 and 19. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. There it is plainly. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. 
We had no relationship with God because sin had broken our relationship with God because of the fall. Since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, there's been a separation. There was communication with God before then, but after that sin, the communication line was broken. Jesus Christ comes on the scene. He dies for, for our sin. He reconciles us to God. And people in the Old Testament are not saved differently. They're looking forward to what Jesus would one day do, what the Messiah would one day do on Calvary. We look back on what he did do. Either way you look, look at it, I'm telling you, it is that sacrifice that reconciled God to us and us to him. Whew. It is wonderful. It is a wonderful truth to realize that Jesus died so that we can be with God. He reconciled us unto himself. Christ's death, what a relationship. I have a relationship because he died for me. What does that mean today? And I'm done. I want you to know this, this Friday before Easter, we always want to think about and, and try to walk in our minds what it might have been like the last week for our Lord. If you're a member of Hilltop and you've been, been in our church for the last year, we have been preaching through the book of Mark and we've talked about his life up until entering Jerusalem. And right now, we're actually covering what takes place. It's exciting to see the life. But that, that last week was an, an unbelievable week. But he knew what was going to happen. And he died. And his death satisfied God. The wrath that was on me was placed on his son. And when God sees me, what truth? He sees the righteousness of his son today. You just doesn't, it just doesn't get any better than that. He satisfied God. The wrath was, was placed on his son and he redeemed me. That's why he died. Can you say that with me? He satisfied God. His wrath was placed on his son. And he redeemed you and me if you're a Christian. And because of this, I stand before you a righteous man in the eyes of God. Not because of what I've done, because I've not lived righteous. But because of what he's done. How important is the death of Christ to the Christian? It satisfied God. It moved the wrath off of us. It redeemed us. Can't wait for Sunday to tell you the end of the story. Thank you for listening. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I hope that just thinking about how much he loved you just in these last few moments, being able to tell you what he did for you to be able to be delivered, to be redeemed. If indeed you have questions about your salvation, you can email me at the church. I promise you I'll, I'll do what I can to help you. It's pastor at hilltopchurch.com. I want people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, today's Friday, and I know it's a symbolic day. Let's remember what he did for us and now why he did it. Thank you so much.